Awesome. So hopefully you can see the screen. Um, I am introducing machine learning with two pretty classical methods, linear and logistic regression. Um, just before we get started, uh, I do want to say that on the GitHub repo, the slides are available in the ML um, or Machine Learning Foundations folder. And um, I will have a presentation now and then show some code so you can follow along in the code as well with your setup. Um, in the code, there will be a challenge, much like George had, um, which will, you know, basically have like a, a short time and a poll um, to complete. And um, yeah, yeah. So when we get started with the code, I'll show um, Docker and Google Colab uh, just just briefly how to access those. Great. So let's get started. Um, so if we were to group, um, you know, all machine learning algorithms based on data and type, um, so supervised would be labeled data, you would have um, techniques like classification and regression. Um, when you have unlabeled data, um, we call that um, unsupervised techniques. Uh, so you could have things like dimensionality reduction, clustering, um, trying to understand the structure of the data itself. Um, and then if you have action reward type, um, you know, a use case, then you would turn, you know, often to reinforcement learning. Awesome. So let's look at um, regression and classification specifically. So let's not confuse, you know, linear versus logistic regression. So just to, to sort of do, separate these out, um, I know these are basic concepts, but you know the basics are are sometimes often where an interviewer will begin, um, just to make sure you have the basics, and you can always start here and build on top of it, right? Um, so linear regression, as we probably know, is for quantitative variables, so numerical var uh, continuous variables. Um, so a quantitative response is modeled directly. Whereas with logistic regression, this is for qualitative or categorical variables. Um, it's a classification method. You can have binary classification, you can have multiple, um, multiple classification or multivariable classification. Um, and the response is actually not modeled directly, but really what we want is the probability that that response, which I call Y, belongs to a specific category. Um, and the decision boundaries are linear. So let's start with the linear regression, our, our continuous variables, our quantitative variables and response. Um, first of all, the assumptions are that there is a relationship between the predictor variables, or x variables, in our data set up to n, um, I'm sorry, up to a, a certain number of variables. Um, in this example, we're just going to deal with one variable, so just x1, um, and the quantitative response variable y. So also for the predictor variables, the relationship to the response variable is linear. Um, we can have nonlinear extensions uh, to linear regression. So I'll show one equation example of that. Uh, so another uh, assumption is constant variance or homoscedasticity on the residual terms or noise. And also the error terms are normally distributed. And finally, independent feature variables are not correlated with each other. So we are looking for um, no collinearity. A lot of these are, are you know, terminology that are, re are really core to classical machine learning. Um, 
and also deep learning methods. So, you know, these are, these are excellent to know as part of your basic tool set. So what are the functions? I'm gonna show um, a lot of math. Um, those who are not familiar with mathematical, mathematical equations, I'll try to give some intuition behind each of the equations. Um, some people learn best by looking at the mathematics. Uh, others may learn better by thinking about the intuition and then moving to the mathematics. So it really depends on your, your, the way you learn. Um, as far as the path you take to, to getting deeper into this material. So linear regression begins, um, if we just have one variable, our response y is equal to a coefficient beta zero plus beta one times x. Okay. So in this example, um, y is our, this is the, the, the true model um, where the coefficient is the actual coefficient um, so beta zero is the actual beta zero, beta one is the actual beta one. Um, if they're estimates, I'll show you how that's written mathematically. Uh, in multiple linear regression, we're gonna have multiple x's. So we kind of, we write it like this, um, where we have a beta one, x one up to, you know, p number of variables, um, independent, um, independent variables, okay? There's extensions we can take with uh, linear regression, such as polynomial regression. So you may see this where we have one variable, x, but we have a term, um, a coefficient term, beta two, which is um, multiplied by the square of x. And this can help us model um, sort of a, a nonlinear space. Great. So there's this awesome data set called the Palmer Penguin data set. It's a, it's a more noisy version of the old IRIS data set for those familiar with um, the IRIS data set and stats. So in this one, we have um, species of penguins, island, their bill length, bill depth, flipper length, body mass, sex, and year. There are three species, if we look at them, um, Chinstrap, Gentoo, and Adali, three islands, um, and I put the data source here. It's actually an R package um, as well, if you are uh, more into the, the R side of things, the R language, that is. Great, so let's estimate some coefficients in an example. So in this example, we're gonna use bill length and bill depth. And let's predict bill depth. So our y variable, our dependent variable will be um, bill depth based on bill length, our one x variable. So in this case, those coefficients are gonna have a little caret on top of them. And that means those are estimates for coefficient beta zero, coefficient beta one. Great. We wanna, like our goal in, creating a model is to find something that is the closest uh, fit to our data points. So we wanna get the best beta zero, also known as the intercept estimate, and beta one, the slope estimate, for the case where we have one x variable. This should look pretty familiar because of our classical y equals mx plus b, um, where one uh, unit um, in X, change in X, uh, will give us a certain change in Y that co this corresponds to our slope or our beta one um, estimate, right? Okay, so one of the most common ways to measure this closeness is least squares criterion. So, and then we have this criterion, right? Like that, in a way that's, that's our measure of closeness. Um, so in stats terms, we're minimizing a residual sum of squares to get to this. Um, and a residual is simply like the actual response 
y um, i for a certain data point where i is is the data point uh, uh, index minus the predicted response. So this this is what is called a residual. So if we sum the squares of all of those for over a number of samples, we get residual sum of squares, which looks like this if we plug in our equation for the response variable. So including our estimate for beta zero and our estimate for co coefficient beta one. So we want some equations that will give us those estimates um, and minimize that RSS, a residual sum of squares. And they end up looking like this. Um, so in this equation, we have, it's, we're summing up a lot of differences. So in this case, the difference data point um, at index i minus the average of all of the x's. Okay, um, and do the same for the response, right? And this will be divided by um, those x values minus the average. Okay, great. So that's actually um, we got there with some with some calculus. So there's a derivation which you can go look up later, um, which gets us there. Um, but you can look at the math and have some intuition about it as well. Um, so for beta, that's for beta one estimate. For beta zero, our intercept, um, it's just the average of y minus that beta one times the average of x. And that's gonna minimize those residual sum of squares. So in this case, with the actual data, um, we get a intercept of 5.3, um, estimate for beta beta one of 0 0.204 and R squared, which we'll talk about, which um, gives us a uh, uh, metric for how good the fit is of 0.4. And if we plot that close that line, right, um, that closest line based on minimizing our residual sum of squares, um, it looks like this. So to assess the, this is actually like a lot of people um, miss this part, right? When when studying for, for interviews, but how do you evaluate your model? How do you assess the fit? Um, so there's a few different ways. You can compute standard errors, examine the confidence intervals, and a couple other ones are assess the accuracy of fit with residual standard error. The residual standard error is actually pretty, pretty simple. It's one over just the number of total samples, minus two. So this fraction, one over n minus two, times the residual sum of squares, okay? And then we take the square root of that. Remember our RSS is just the um, difference of the, the actual y minus the estimate of y. Um, so we, we remember we want this to be small, okay? Um, and then, so in that case, you know, we want this value to be small. Um, the more numbers, we, the more samples we have, the smaller this is. Um, and you just take the square root of that. So we're actually trying to get a very small residual standard error. So that kind of makes sense, right? Um, another cool way to assess the fit is the R squared statistic. Um, this one's actually really nice because it's it, it's um, within the range of zero to one. It's proportion based, um, where one is like a perfect fit. So it also uses residual, residual sum of squares and something called the total sum of squares. Um, so our total sum of squares actually looks a lot like our residual sum of squares. Um, and it's it's actually our, our actual y's minus the mean of the y values uh, squared. Okay, so for like each data point, um, we we take we take this number. So um, 
really, in, we want this term RSS over TSS to be small, right? Because then whatever we're subtracting one minus a small number, we're gonna get closer to one. Um, so remember, we, we want our RSS value to be small because we, don't, we want our, act, you know, our predicted to be close to our actuals. So that kind of makes sense too, right? Um, so you can, you can reason through these, uh, think about the intuition, um, and, and, and then also it helps you not to have to memorize something. So this is evaluating our fit of, of the model, of the um, linear regression model. Great. So other topics I would really encourage you to look at is classical statistical null hypothesis versus alternative hypothesis. You know, what does that mean? Null hypothesis is that there's no correlation, no relationship rather, between our response and our, um, and our variable x. So we have t statistic, p values. So these are other ways to evaluate the model. Um, and also to let us reject the null hypothesis. Let's move on to logistic regression. So we're going to look at the Palmer Penguin data set again. And in this case, our response variable is going to be sex. So it's binary. It's male and female. It's categorical, right? Uh, in this case, let's let x be build depth, OK? So um, this might be, sorry, it might be a little confusing because I think I used build depth uh, for the response in linear regression. But now we're using it as our variable, our independent variable. Great. So instead of, remember, getting just the, um, the raw values, the continuous value for our, our response, we want probabilities of male or female given build depth. So written, you know, you might see these probability y response is female given x or is male given x. Okay. So some assumptions um, for logistic regression is, you know, obviously our response variable is categorical. Um, doesn't have an ordering. Logistic regression models um, binary or multi-class classification problems where our decision boundaries are linear. Um, also, data is independent and identically distributed. Gen it's generated by independent sampling repeatedly from the same distribution, um, from the same population distribution. What if, okay, so this is an interesting question, right? What if we use linear regression on a qualitative response? Um, so let's take the case, this case of binary response, male, female. Uh, and we're going to say zero if female, one if male um, as our response. And we want probabilities. So, but we're going to try linear regression, see what happens. Um, so let's then say it's, our, our response is female if it's less than 0.5, male if it's greater than or equal to 0.5. Um, so we plot that, and you can see, you know, at one, these are, these are all the male penguins and their build depth. You know, zero, these are the um, female penguins and their, um, sorry, let me see, Bill, I might have misspoke. Bill, Bill linked as the label here. Um, so, uh, but the orange line here is the model with linear regression. So what's the problem? Yeah, if you take a look, it's, it's that we have, we get negative numbers, um, so less than zero, and numbers greater than zero, and probabilities need to be between zero and one. So what are, what are we going to do about that? Um, so let's introduce the wonderful logistic regression function. Um, so, so our response with linear regression, remember, is y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. In the logistic function, um, we're modeling probabilities, so probabilities, um, and we use the Euler number, so it's e to that y value over 1 plus e to that y 
response value that you saw in linear regression. So this is logistic regression. Um, what does what does this um, make happen for us? Uh, so for you know, it's remember probability. It's based on our penguin buildup data. Um, and we care about probabilities. We want something between zero and one. If we use the logistic function on the penguin data set and we plot it where zero remember is female and one is male, we get a curve where this is the model in orange and it's approaching one as we get closer, um, as we get our, our bill length is um, increasing. And then it approaches zero or female as the link is decreasing. Great. So finding um, the estimates for these coefficients, we use something called maximum likelihood. So we're trying to maximize a function called the likelihood function. Um, and we're, we're remember we're trying to estimate um, again like beta zero and beta one. Um, and recall, you know, I just wrote the logistic function. Um, so we're using, we want, we want to be able to plug the, the best values into our equation for probabilities, um, such that we get zero for female and close to one for male. And this is our likelihood function. Um, we're not going to go into the derivation, uh, but we want to maximize this function. So on a different related topic, I just want you to be aware of the curse of dimensionality. So that's when we have just a ton of features, variables, features and variables, sometimes those words are used in, um, interchangeably. So most like statistical machine learning approaches, classical methods, they're really meant for low dimensional data where the number of features is lower than the number of samples. For instance, um, say we have like 10,000 bank transactions and two variables, two features, balance and default status from these bank statement data sets. So that would be a, a good candidate for using a classical method. Uh, whereas say you have an image data set where each pixel is a feature and it's a small pixel or it's a small image and there's a thousand features, right? So it's a hundred by hundred pixel image, it's pretty small. But still, that's a huge amount of features, and we may have only 100 images. So that's a wide data set. And you may, you could try logistic regression, of course. Um, but, you know, oftentimes you hear about people turning to like deep learning methods for image or very large feature data sets. Um, you can use uh, for, for large feature, for large amount of features, Things like principal component analysis, which is a dimensionality reduction algorithm, um, to trans transform those high high dimensional data sets down to um, you know more manageable number of features, and then just a little bit of interview guidance from from my experience. Um, I think we were talking about this a little bit earlier with George's session, uh, but you know. Interviews, they look for solid understanding basics. If, if you don't have the basics, really it's hard to build up to something more complex. Um, and interviews, you know, often they'll start with the basics. Like how much do you know um, about just ba basic things and intuition um, around different topics in stats and machine learning? So another recommendation is find your best way of learning and go with that. Whether it's books, videos, getting a tutor, um, whether it's math first or intuition first, um, one caveat is just make sure you vet your sources. Um, because sometimes, you know, you can find anything on the internet, but just try to try to find something that's like I go with books oftentimes because I know it's it's pretty well vetted by multiple editors and reviewers. So balance becoming a good Python or R programmer with the basics and underlying theory and ML. 
um, programming guidance is like ask questions and pause and make sure you've listened well and understood the problem. Asking clarifying questions is oftentimes part of it because interviewers sometimes leave out things intentionally. Have pen and paper ready to brainstorm just right next to you. Um, write doc strings, comments, clean code, um, practice coding on coding platforms just to become a really sharp programmer, like one to two questions a day for, I don't know, a month or two. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to get up, you're rusty and you need to, to practice your programming. Some memo guidance, you know, like I said, basic theory and intuition. Uh, be ready to talk about a school or open source project that involves some sort of data science or ML. Um, every interview is practice for the next. Great. So I have some references. Um, a lot of this was taken from the Introduction to Stat Statistical Learning. Great book by James Witten Hasty and um, Chip Sharani. So check that out. Uh, these are, yeah, these are in the slides. And check my time. Cool. So let's move on to the notebooks, uh, to the code section. Maybe I should check for any questions. I think there's some questions. Um, yeah, there's some questions in the chat. You want to take a look at next time? Oh, I see. Great. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Great. Yeah, so R squared um, needs to be between zero and one. Um, that's, yeah, R squared may be negative. Um, trying to think. Um, if we look at, let's take a look at our equation. Great. So yeah, it sh it should be between um, zero and one. I guess there, you know, if if you have like um, residual sum of squares that is just you know a a lot greater than the difference between you know y minus the mean. I guess in theory, you could have an R squared that can go negative. Um, so I apologize for sort of misleading you there. Um, but it's really, really uncommon to see that. Um, so thank you. Uh, R pi 2 is your friend. Yeah. Particular coding practice platform you recommend? I use Leak Code. Um, I think there are other ones out there. It was a good coding practice platform. Yeah. Hacker Rank, Leak Code. Yeah, they're software engineering oriented, not really data science, but that's where you want to get strong. A lot of data science interviews nowadays are part of the, in my opinion, um, the reason they're getting harder is they kind of expect a little bit of a unicorn. So a lot of, you know, them will have a a pretty um, stringent uh, software engineering portion because they want to make sure you're a strong programmer as well. Um, yeah. It's a good book. Cool. Okay. Uh, 
I'm looking at, oh, this is a good question. Oh, so there was a good question about minimize, maximize, um, you know, um, criterions. Um, so this is always going to be important. We're always going to need to minimize or maximize a function of machine learning um, and deep learning. Oftentimes you're hearing about minimizing things like stochastic gradient descent or gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent um, or atom or things like this. Um, in our case for logistic regression, uh, we wanted to use to maximize the likelihood function. So it really does depend on um, the, the criterion you're working with. Yeah. Data structures and algorithms, very important for interviews. Yeah, great. Okay, um, great questions so far. So let's switch over to the coding portion. Um, there's, I'm using the Docker image, and so I have the all the repo available to me within the Docker image. Um, so that's awesome. There's also in the workshops in the M Machine Learning Foundations folder a Google Colab link. So if you click on that. Um, should take you to, for me, I, I guess I'm editing, but I think you might be in view only. So what you would do is click file, oops, file, um, save a copy in drive. And that should allow you to modify your own notebook. Um, another caveat of using Google Colab versus the Docker image is that in using Colab, you'll have to go get the penguins data set and then um, upload, let's see, there's a, there's a way to upload. Yeah, files. Oh, here we go, yeah, great. It had to connect to my runtime. So you can go to files and you can upload a file um, within the Google Colab system. So if you have questions, I think folks can help you out um, while we're going through this. Um, but let's begin with the Docker container uh, version. Cool. cool, cool, cool. So I'm going to, let's see if I can kind of make this a little bigger. So I'm going to import the libraries. We're going to use scikit-learn in this case. Um, so in the data folder, there's a CSV file which has all of those variables that I showed during the presentation. I'm going to use pandas to read my CSV file. So if we look at the top 10 entries, Right, so it's a pandas data frame now. If we look at the top 10 entries with the head function, um, we can see we have all those variables that we saw during the presentation. And we have 344 data points. Notice there's some NA NANs for not a number. Um, so we're just gonna take note of that. If we look at the, we can subset with the penguin data data frame by column with just the string column name, okay? So if I do a set on all of the species, right, the species column here, we can see the different, there's three species of penguin. Awesome. There's also a describe function in pandas data frames, which gives us statistical um, information. So if we take the data frame, use describe, um, we can see for species, which is actually categorical, right? Um, it, get, it gives us unique of three, so that's interesting. Um, island is also categorical. The length here 
that's a continuous variable, right? Um, so we get the count should be the same for everything. Um, although some are not a number, so counts might be different. Um, so, but what's nice is it gives you descriptive statistics. So the mean, the standard deviation, the min, our um, quartiles here, and our max. So that's pretty useful if you want to see the spread of your data or see if there are any weird sentinel values. Um, you can look at your max and min, make sure those all make sense. Um, so let's take a look deeper into um, one of the species, and we're going to take a look at build length predicting uh, our response variable build depth. So build length is our x and build depth is our y. Okay, so what did I just do here? I got the Gen 2 species only, and I subsetted the um, data set with, to get just build length and build depth. Um, as columns. So you can see that's what happened here. So if we want to plot our features, we can do so by using a scatter plot. Great. So you see build length on the x axis and build depth on the y axis. So one thing you saw there were NAs. In pandas, there's a nice function called drop na. Um, in place just means it's going to do it. Like I don't have to set it gen2 data equal to gen2 data drop na. It will just do it in place. We can run that and look at the shape. So we have 123 um, versus 124 up here. So that means there was one row that had na values in it. Um, great. So let's see. Is there anything? I mean, we could take a look at the data set again. Um, but let's go ahead and just fit a variable, um, fit our variable to the linear regression model. Um, so as I said, x is the length, y response variable is build up. We're using the link to predict build up. Um, I'm making my, my x and my y into numpy arrays. Um, that's how scikit-learn wants my data. I'm going to shuffle it just in case um, there's patterns or you know they, they have groupings like within the ordering of, of the data. So that's a nice function from scikit-learn. Um, I'm going to split my data because we want a training set and a test set. Um, I'm going to run the model on my test set later on, uh, but for now, let's split it. I'm going to use a test size of 0.1, which means 10% I'm going to reserve for testing. Then I'm going to fit with the linear regression function to the training data. Next. You know, we're going to use that held out data set, the test data set, to run a prediction, which is y pred here. Um, we're going to look at the coefficient. So that's actually going to correspond to our beta 1 and the intercept. Um, so that's the y intercept. So coefficients are slope, y intercept. Um, we're going to plot it as well. And then we're going to plot our model. Um, model fit. Awesome. So what are some measures of a good regressor? Um, we can look at mean squared error as well as the R squared, which is also called coefficient of determination. Um, so we can plot or um, run that and we see our mean squared error is 0.5 coefficient or R squared is 0.37, so it's not very good. As you can see, looking at the test data, we don't have much data, um, so there's probably an error term within here that's that's quite large. Um, but you know, we do draw the the model the model fit, and um, we can get the R squared with scikit-learn's R squared score function. Okay. 
So what about logistic regression? Let's look at um, penguin species. So we're gonna create the data set. In this case, our qualitative or categor categorical variable is species. So we're gonna use, in this case, just two of the three species above. Um, we're gonna use Chinstrap and Gentoo. So I'm going to um, also get build depth um, as our um, predictor. Or not our predictor, sorry, what we want to predict, our response variable. Our predictors are going to be species. Great, so um, in this case, I'm just removing the Adali species, um, doing some drop NA. Um, we're gonna print just to make sure we um, see the species um, that we've selected and look at the shape of the data. Great, so we have Gen2 and Shinstrap. Um, so these are strings, right? String values. Most ML algorithms need variables as a numerical um, var uh, value, even categorical variables. So we're going to use something called dummy variables um, where we encode our, our categor categorical variable. Um, so Gen2 is going to be equal, equal to zero um, and our Gen's drop is going to be one. So if we look at that, um, actually, yeah, let's, let's take a look at that. And then I added this, I print the set species data um, and that column species. So I actually overwrote my, my, my um, string values with my encoded values here. Um, yeah, so that is an important part of machine learning. <laughs> So let's, uh, let's choose our X and Y. Remember, X is going to be a build up and we wanna predict species. That's our Y, we shuffle our data. Um, we do a test strain split. Awesome. So remember that question, what if we fit a linear regression model with our binary species data? So what would that look like? Okay, so like in that um, presentation, here we have one and zero. So one is chinstrap. Um, as you can see, they, they have a greater build depth um, on average. And zero is gen two. So here's the gen two and build up. Um, and we're using build up to predict this. We want, for logistic regression, recall we want probabilities. Um, so we're not modeling it direct, you know, di the, the response directly. We want the probabilities. Um, and the, the issue you recall here is that we're getting negative and negative probabilities and greater than one probabilities. So let's, let's try the logistic regression now. Um, we're gonna use the logistic regression from scikit-learn. We're gonna fit our training data and we're gonna check the, um, the accuracy score. So here we have a score of 90, about 95%. Uh, so that's really quite good. Um, and then let's do a prediction on our test data. So remember our X data is um, going to be build up or predicting species, right? So um, also in this, we're going to plot the probabilities um, where our probabilities are going to look like that um, sort of S-shaped S curve and they're going to be between zero and one. So as you can see, here we go. Um, it makes sense because if our bill links are, you know, smaller um, over here, we're hoping to be predicting more and more the Gen 2 species, which is encoded as zero. And then for the ones that are encoded as one, the chinstrap species, 
our bill depths as they increase, we want to, you know, have increased probability that it is a chinch drop penguin. So awesome. So it did really well, you know, with with even just one one predictor. Um, so uh, yeah, here's a challenge. I'm gonna give you all about um, three minutes, and I want you to. Um, recall from the lecture what the logistic function was, and um, this is a sigmoid curve, so it's 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 just some made up data where x equals um, 100 values between minus one and minus 10 and 10, um, and just remember that um, NumPy has a uh, Euler number where you can exponentiate it. With certain values, um, that's oh, I, do I have this here? I think you might have to look it up. Um, but anyway, fill in the following equation here: z based on x, right? That will give us that sigmoid curve that you saw here. Okay. So I'll give you all, um, yeah, three minutes. Okay, about one more minute. Cool. So let's do a poll. Um, let me see if I can get back there. Um, great. So let's see. I would like to ask you, what is the upper limit of this 
sigmoid curve plot. Um, so is it 2, 10, 0.5, 1, or did you, oops, I need to launch the poll. Um, I did not solve it today. Awesome. So it looks like um, I, I'll just end the poll. Oh, there's some more votes coming in. Okay, uh, I'm going to end the poll. Let's see what um, those who voted said. So it looks like most people um, voted for one. So that is correct. Uh, so if we solve this, um, here, let me see if I can share the results. Okay. Cool. So just note there's, there's actually like, it's a little confusing. There's a couple equations for the logistic function. Um, I'm going to use the one that we went Yes, I'm off mute. So I'm going to use the one that we went over in the lecture. Um, NumPy has a function for the for exponentiating um, the Euler number. It's np.exp. So in this case, just x over one one plus n np. And so what we see is the upper limit is one and the lower limit is zero. Um, and um, yeah, so great, great job everyone. So what's a measure of a good classifier? Um, let's take a look. So one really cool um, table is called a confusion matrix. It's kind of a funny name, but let's go ahead and take a look. We're gonna, um, use our test data for this uh, instance. So it's just a, um, a subset of X and Y data. And we're going to plot it with matplotlib. It's a little hard to see. So if we zoom in. Um, So yeah, in this we have um, over here on sort of the y-axis is the true label, and on the sort of the, the horizontal axis is predicted label. So for this case of the Gen 2 penguins, we have for um, Gen 2, true label 24, and um, actually, um, for chin strap, two, so, sorry, Gen 2 predicted 24 and, um, or true labels 24, predicted label um, 20. The agreement is 24. Um, for Gen 2, uh, where true label um, was chin strap, it predicted two to um, to be Gen 2. Okay, so, um, and in this case, uh, true label um, Gen 2 here, predicted Gen strap um, 0, and for true label Gen strap, predicted Gen strap 13. Okay, so it did really well for, for Gen strap and pretty well for Gen 2. Um, what is, an issue with our classification experiment, looking at these numbers.
just giving you a moment to think. So someone said class imbalance, and that is correct. It's not great that we didn't look at that first, right? Because uh, in classification experiments, um, almost always, well, there are, there are some techniques where it, it doesn't matter as much, but in most techniques, we want a balanced class set. So we, we don't have any bias, right? Um, it's also just not mathematically as stable um, to have an imbalanced class set. Cool. So let me zoom out a little bit. Um, so for the last uh, port part, there's we can look at a classification report, which are metrics. Um, I didn't talk about these in the lecture, but they are actually pretty important. Um, so what we're looking at here is precision, recall, F1 score, and support. Um, so precision is really interesting. We can break it down by class. So zero, remember, was the Gen 2 penguins, and one was the Gen Strap penguins. So as you can see, like for Gen 2, um, the precision is 0.92. For Gen Strap is 1, which makes sense given our confusion matrix over here. Um, everything true was predicted for Gen Strap to be Gen Strap. So that makes sense. Um, so what is precision, though? Um, precision is our true positives. Um, so things that were predicted to be Gen 2 that are actually Gen 2 um, over the true positives plus false positives. Um, so, so that's precision recall is actually more like, um, I'll give you the equation to give you some intuition. It's the true positives. So the ones that are predicted to be um, Gen 2 that are also truly Gen 2, that's true positive, uh, divided by our true positives plus false negatives. OK, so I'll let you think about that for a moment. Um, if you do look at those equations and try to find some intuition behind it, that um really really helps so cool here's a final challenge which i don't think we let me look at the time we may not have time for this then well, i guess we can go for another five minutes so but i'd like to stop and just look at the questions um and let let you take home this challenge. So I, what I want you to do is look up maybe like in scikit-learn, since we're using scikit-learn, um, off-the-shelf classifiers like the support vector machines or k-nearest neighbor algorithms and replace that logistic regression with a different classifier. Um, and look at the classification experiment, look at your confusion matrix, your precision, your recall, F1 score is harmonic mean of precision and recall. So sometimes people just want one metric. Um, a business stakeholder just wants one metric that represents precision and recall together. Um, so yeah, try, try different types of um, classifiers within this experiment, because there are a ton of options uh, for you all. So thank you so much. Um, for listening and going through the code with me. Yeah, thank you all for listening. Um, really nice to have everyone here. Uh, so cool. I think, awesome. Um, so there is a question. 
Uh, this is this is good. Can you speak to how to choose test train split? Would this be a typical question covered by an interviewer? Um, actually, yes. This <laughs> this is a good question. Um, so there's something hidden that I didn't tell you about in some of the um, ML algorithms, um, but Okay, so we have test and train. So oftentimes um, we wanna split our data set because we wanna hold out a piece of our test data set. Remember that the test data set is still from the same population as the training data set. So just remember that in your mind, like it's not necessarily truly a wild out there data set um, it's our test data set, which is from the same same group, same population as the train. Um, however, it's a good proxy so, sometimes um, if we don't have any like data drift or things like that. Um, it's a good proxy to initially test test the you know look at the metrics, look at our predictions, um, plot plot the graphs like we did you know up here. Um, For, you know, this is looking at, at the test data, right, only. Um, and so we train on train, we test test with test. Um, there's also a type of data set called the validation data set, not to be confused with the test data set. Um, so the validation is used concurrently with a training data set um, within the, the process of training your, training your algorithm. Um, and another thing I would look at is cross-validation. So that's a super important concept. Um, it helps with um, basically uh, giving us, actually giving us sometimes usually a more robust model, um, but it's, it's a really nice way to, um, to train the data set. Um, and give us, give us just, yeah, give us a more robust model. Um, I'm not gonna cover it uh, just because I think we have like one more minute, but please take a look at those concepts. Um, I think they would uh, be something that would uh, maybe be addressed in an interview. I know that one interviewer one time asked me what the logistic uh, logistic function was. So that kind of inspired me to uh, talk about this um, this subject. So, um, and I know it can be confusing if you're just starting out in data science too. So.